Um, here we go. You should be able to see um, uh, my screen share, I hope. Yeah, Can you're you all good. Great. Okay. Well, we, we started, uh, well, we ended the last time with um, the uh, arrival of the railways um, and <clears throat> the uh, turnpike system in its absolute heyday. And I think things were uh, destined to change quite quickly. Um, so, uh, David, you mentioned we had the, uh, was it the Stockton and Darlington Railway in the 19, 1820s? Yeah, and by um, in 1829 was the trial for the Liverpool to Manchester, opened 1830, and most of the stagecoaches um, between Liverpool and Manchester, the many of them, finished that year, and all had gone um, within a year or two. So, well, here we have a notable railway journey. On the left is Frederick Chopin, the, um, uh, the composer. Um, he was uh, dying of tuberculosis pretty much at this stage in his life, um, <clears throat> but he went on a, um, a Scottish concert tour and it's recorded that he, um, he took the new train service from London Euston to Edinburgh Lothian Road, um, which is not far from Haymarket now, it was a temporary station. Um, uh, it took 12 hours and uh, I, I think the average speed wasn't 33 miles an hour, it was substantially more than 33 miles an hour because it I don't think they use the East Coast main line. Um, before, going by sea might have been the quickest route and that would have taken about three days. Um, going by coach, well, I, I think um, coaches at the time were working up to 10, maybe even 12 miles an hour, average speeds, but um, undertaking a 400 mile journey um, without uh, allowing the passengers to, 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 to stop overnight, I think you're talking several days journey to get up to um, to, to Scotland. Um, so, I mean, basically the railways were completely transformative of uh, inland transport, long distance. And <clears throat> they're, they're experienced a decline in uh, interurban uh, traffic, or, uh, especially on the turnpikes. I think there are records of uh, traffic declining by a third, a half, even, even two thirds on some. There's a lovely book called "The Highways and Byways of Yorkshire," printed in eighteen ninety nine, which describes the uh, desolate Great North Road, which once was thronged with stagecoaches and only the solitary cyclist to be found. Um, oh, well, well. Um, because the um, travel in general in uh, in Victorian times, uh, road travel increased enormously. It was long distance. Uh, travel that, uh, that switched the railways, with a huge number of horses and carriages uh, feeding into the railway system. So by the end of the Victorian times, the rise of population, the increase in the economy, there were many more horses than had ever been. Well, you we're, we're now getting on to bridges. So I, I think David's going to talk about an extensive bridge building uh, programme that serves the growing economies of uh, towns and cities. So many, many new bridges in uh, in London. Um, we saw last uh, last year, last week rather, or the week before, the um, one of the last, the last of the greatest of the stone bridges built in London, Waterloo Bridge. Um, at the same time as Waterloo Bridge was built, Southwark Bridge, also built by Rennie, was built with these massive uh, wrought iron arches. I mean, cast iron arches. Um, acting in many respects a bit like a stone bridge, though engineers will correct me. Um, and it lasted until the uh, last about 100 years, until it was decided it wasn't wide enough, and so was replaced by the, uh, by the present structure. So we're coming to the end of the era of great stone bridges and switching over to uh, uh, cast iron for, um, for some very large spans. <laughs> Right, um, this uh, interesting, uh, a suspension bridge, another style of building bridges, 1826, uh, the uh, Telford. The extraordinary thing about this is that uh, it is an extraordinary achievement, a remarkable achievement, but built as the climax of the only new road built probably between the Romans and the 20th century, um, the, uh, the, Holly, the Holyhead Road. Um, 
subsequently the A5 in the 20th century. Um, but at the very moment it was open, uh, long distance road traffic uh, was ceasing because of the cost of the railways. How, uh, how typical. Carry on, Robert. Um, so I think it was later, actually, I think it's 1856. So with the building of Waterloo Bridge, they, I mean, with the building of these new bridges, um, both uh, stone bridges and then uh, suspension bridges and cast iron uh, bridges, it was no longer necessary to have two of the most difficult and most expensive to maintain bridges, Rochester and London. Um, London went in 1831. I think Rochester was in the 1850s, but maybe maybe Robert's right. Um, and it was uh, it was surprisingly difficult to uh, to get rid of the old bridge, which had uh, you know, which had served for centuries, and they had to use lots of high explosives and the military to do it. And a great crowd came out to watch it. But that is the sort of the last of the the great southern estuarine medieval ridges goes. Okay, Robert. Um, of course, the 18th century uh, replacements in, in London Bridge, like Westminster, Blackfriars, the new ones of that period didn't last very long. And, um, and the cast iron bridge, the old Westminster Bridge wasn't very well founded, though you know, thought in the 1750s when it was built to be a very modern bridge, had poor foundations which weren't properly piled and weren't laid in copper dams. And a century later, it had to be replaced by the cast iron Westminster Bridge, which is the, the oldest surviving bridge in central London, I think now. Okay, Robert. Uh, and, and finally, the, no, no, probably not finally, um, the last uh, great hurrah for, uh, for stone bridges, 200 foot span um, in Chester, Thomas Harrison, um, a magnificent structure, but of course, things like this were, were not to be built again. I will just add that, um, that it wasn't very much larger than the medieval stone bridges. They had um, bridges of over 150 foot in Verona built in the 14th century. But anyway, this is the, so to speak, the climax and end of, uh, of stone bridge building. So uh, over to that, you. that's the end of our uh, the bridge section. Um, very much focusing on um, uh, strategic movement, I think. Um, so now we turn to towns and what's happening in towns, um, the public health crisis and the public health movement. The, um, the population in uh, towns and cities was increasing very rapidly. And the, um, the arrival of the potato plays no small part, but that's another story altogether. But it's something to do with um, uh, vitamin C and stuff like that. Um, so let's continue on. I, I think you'll recognize this stuff for the, the sorts of prob problems that we're experienced in, in places such as Manchester or, or Liverpool or Birmingham or, or many of the industrial towns and indeed London too. Um, and uh, there was a, a health of new towns association that was established. They described uh, residents of Whitechapel as being cooped up, filthy in habits, debased in morals, oppressed with want, abandoned and reckless. Um, poor sanitation, contaminated water supplies. We all know about um, cholera and typhoid. Um, uh, poor air quality. Um, this this link to rickets, um, uh, the sunshine blocking smoke, preventing uh, people from making vitamin D, which they would do naturally in the presence of ultraviolet light, uh, as well as poor diet. And it's a problem that is being experienced today with the changes in, um, in lifestyle as people are spending a lot more time indoors. And uh, there is a health impact in so many different ways. Um, the life expectancy um, fell to appalling levels. So there you can see um, uh, laboring uh, children born of laboring uh, families in places such as Bolton or Liverpool, um, they they would not be expected to live into their 20s. Um, there was very high rates of infant mortality. Um, things were better out in the uh, in rural towns uh, and in rural areas generally, um, but it, uh, it was a, a hugely serious problem. And 
uh, here you can see a, a graph of the population pyramids. Um, the a graph of 1861 uh, shows it's an exponential decline in, in population as uh, the year of age progresses. Um, a, a certain proportion of the uh, each year, birth year, was being killed by infectious diseases. Nowadays, um, our, our population pyramid is much more like a column. Um, uh, it, it's only uh, old age that uh, carries off uh, our souls or whatever it carries off. Um, infectious disease has, um, for much of the past 50, 60, 70 years, been under control. Um, but it isn't always under control. We needn't be complacent about that. Um, examples of the sorts of conditions. So you've got narrow, narrow streets. Um, the sanitation would have been uh, absent. Uh, water supplied by uh, water pumps, um, street pumps, standpipes, um, air pollution. If you can imagine all of those chimneys belching out smoke, um, smoke uh, only even for cooking. So there would not be an awful lot of respite in summer months either. Um, Just to interrupt, you'll have noticed the fascinating, uh, oh, we've not lost it, the fascinating central gully. Oh, yes. <clears throat> anyway, carry on. Uh, and just another example. So there you, you see a, a court, um, ventilation, uh, the, the purging of uh, whatever foul air there is at ground level is, is limited by the closeness of the buildings and the fact that uh, this particular court would probably not be open at either end. It, it would be, it's blocked off at the far end and it would be pr probably approached under an arch at the other end. Um, so. A lot of uh, discussion was conducted about diseases. We had th th there was miasma theory. Night air was considered dangerous. People associated bad smells with disease. Um, and progressively, there were advances in science and understanding. And um, Florence Nightingale, I mean, she's remembered as a, a nurse, but she was first and foremost a statistician. Um, she did a huge amount to. Um, enable the analysis of infectious disease. Um, there was the great stink uh, of 1858, um, which brought poor sanitation home to politicians in Westminster. Um, and if at the time bad smells were associated with the risk of disease, then obviously there's a, a great motivation to do something about it. Um, germ theory uh, only emerged uh, in the second half of the century. And there's the famous uh, Broad Street cholera outbreak associated with a, a pump, a single standpipe in Broad Street uh, that Dr. John Snow uh, associated carefully with um, a, a individual outbreaks, individual cases of cholera. And, and so the understanding started to emerge that cholera was a water-based disease. Um, so that there's a list of the d diseases that plagued the, the 19th century, and some of those could be solved by sa sanitation, but others depend on, uh, well, good hygiene, but ultimately to the advances that were to occur in the, in the 20th century in terms of antibiotics and vaccination. Um, so, but obviously <laughs> public health has probably been the most important thing, better public health and, and sewage and clean water. Has quite been absolutely vital. Um, so, what was happening in terms of the uh, the spirit of the age? There were novels being written uh, in the 1830s and 1840s about the plight of um, the uh, poorer people in the community. So, Benjamin Disraeli writing about uh, Sybil or the Two Nations, and Charlotte Bronte uh, in the novel Shirley, and of course the Bronte family. Um, they were carried off. Uh, I think the majority of were carried off by by um, tuberculosis. Um, so I mean, it, it was an, an appalling an appalling time. And we, we forget how lucky um, we are in this century with all of the uh, medical advances that are available to us. Um, so anyway, this can create a sort of emotional um, uh, impetus for things to be done. And there were um, commissions, uh, the report of the sanitary condition of the laboring population, Edwin Chadwick, uh, that was hugely important. And Edwin Chadwick himself 
was a, a massively important uh, source of energy and drive in obtaining changes to the uh, the health of towns and cities. And then we have the Health of, of Towns Association. Um, this is a, a, a copy of the, a lecture, a talk that was given um, by a member of the Health of Towns Association. And the things that he's focusing on are deficient ventilation and deficient drainage. Um, so in the absence of any other understanding, um, that's what they tried to provide. Um, so uh, they talked about um, house drains, drainage, um, sewerage, sanitation, ventilation, scavenging, which means the cleansing of streets, uh, the, the removal of waste, and also the widening of the streets. And the widening of the streets is there to improve ventilation. Um, so here's uh, David's very kindly spotted a, um, a, a historical map of um, uh, street paving. And of course, you, you can't really clean streets if they are not appropriately surfaced. Um, so having set setted streets uh, it, it is pretty important in terms of being able to remove horse manure. I didn't think the, um, the, the, so many of the streets are paved with, uh, with wood. And um, this got better and better, and they used some Australian wood called Jarrah towards the end, um, which seemed particularly hard and, and suitable for road surfaces, and was particularly fashionable often in the uh, in, in some of the uh, some of the smarter areas. And you'll all remember your Sherlock Holmes, where you can tell where he is from the sound of the wheels um, in his uh, his handsome cap. Ashfeld's course, and Tom Academ comes in in, uh, in the early 20th century with the County Surveyor from Nottingham. The types of bitumen had been used before then. Sorry, Robert. Um, here we have an example of wood paving, and this is in Margate. Somebody's, uh, the, the highway authorities have scraped off the uh, road surface, um, exposing the wood beneath. And you, you can see wood, wooden uh, uh, paving blocks in various parts of certainly of London and, and elsewhere, um, they're sometimes retained in, in, in gully um, uh, inspection covers uh, where there's a uh, in, inset um, space for receiving some sort of surfacing material. Um, and uh, a wide range of paving materials uh, are used. M Mount Sorrel Grano diorite, Mount Sorrel Granite, um, uh, from a quarry just south of massive quarry just south of Nottingham, um, the the materials were spread by whatever transportation system uh, was available. So uh, the Mount Sorrel quarry quarries were served by the London North Eastern Railway. Um, so you'll tend to get Mount Sorrel granites in areas which are served by the LNER. A lot of, uh, a lot of London granite sets that we can date actually are mid-Victorian. Um, they're not always easy to date. Um, some have been, for example, in Charterhouse Square near Smithfield, and that's from the that's from the 1860s, and obviously very dependent on the railways. On, on the right-hand side, um, there's uh, a, a street scene in Edinburgh, uh, um, and you can see what probably are uh, Aberdeen granites there. Um, plus windstone, a sort of basalt um, that you get <clears throat> locally in that part of Scotland. Um, and there is the, the self same street. Um, this one is uh, in Carlisle. Um, th these are probably windstone, windstone cubes. And it looks quite elegant and it's actually quite a, a smooth and I think satisfactory surface. Um, if it's looked after properly and the, the structure isn't destroyed by utility companies. It, and, uh, it, might, it might or might not be worth saying that um, but often before sets they used cobbles and there's a there's a fine cobble street which I guess has always been cobbled which is Merton Street in Oxford which uh, which which survives. Um, the macadam that was used in um, invented in the early 19th century was it said, said small stones, small graded stones um, on a good in, uh, substrata that was uh, that was pressed down by the uh, by the traffic that went over it. And That's, there were some, there were some uh, <clears throat> Macadam streets uh, 
in towns and of course they were the norm outside uh, town. I think it's, it's a good point that the pressing down is a very good point to make. Um, these these uh, sets or, 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 or cubes were, were set in, in grit and the action of horses hooves and uh, steel iron shod wheels would be there to force them down even further. Um, so the, the surface was naturally being compacted. Um, there weren't the transverse, the lateral forces that uh, you get with uh, rubber tires and power brakes that we get on these surfaces now. Um, but it, as you can see, the, the surface is very smooth. One shouldn't assume that a, uh, a setted street is going to be rough. It doesn't need to be. Um, if it is rough, then it's probably not a good example of, of competent workmanship. Um, whereas, a, whereas a cobble street obviously would have been, which mostly predated the sets, would have been very rough. Indeed, yes. Um, well, <clears throat> so what, what gets deposited? Uh, tons and tons of manure. And uh, if you go to the internet, you can hear about um, the uh, uh, 1894 manure crisis, um, which apparently is fake news. There was no such thing. There, there was no, um, no crisis and possibly not even any article in the Times to that effect. Um, because there was a lot of attention to dealing with the problem. So uh, we had, there were scavengers who were employed to clear the streets uh, and take the, take the material away. Um, <clears throat> it would be recycled. Um, there were crossing sweepers, and here we're in a painting by William Powell Frith. Um, but it, it very much demonstrates the disparity in uh, wealth and affluence. Um, <clears throat> uh, the crossing sweeper there, young lad, who doesn't have the benefit of shoes. Um, he's got slit, um, slit jeans, which I, I understand are quite popular nowadays, but um, um, the crossing sweeper nuisance, a cartoon that appeared. Um, so um, that's the, the sort of management side of things. In terms of the legislation, um, 1847, we have the Town Improvement Clauses Act, and there's a specification uh, that carriage roads shall be at least 30 feet wide, and if it's not a carriage road, at least 20 feet wide. And uh, in the same year, the Town Police Clauses Act, which introduces the offence of furious riding. Um, it introduces a lot of other interesting offences, um, such as uh, knocking on doors and running away. Uh, kite flying was illegal. Um, it was illegal to hang washing from one side of the street to another or um, the, uh, the, the issuing of profanities um, in the street, that was also illegal. Um, sadly, these, uh, these offences were um, uh, 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 eliminated um, in the um, uh, Deregulation Act. Uh, is that about 2011 when the government decided there were too many laws? Um, I think it's a great shame personally. Um, anyway, so we got the Town Improvement Clauses Act, 30 foot wide streets. And then uh, 1875, the Public Health Act, so-called the Great Public Health Act, um, that's introduced a minimum requirement for width of streets of 36 feet. And subsequently in London, the London Building Act of 1894, this was increased to 40 foot in width. So that's ordinary carriage roads, roads intended as a carriage road, um, those are dimensions. Um, if the, the streets were shorter, then narrower, um, uh, narrower streets would be accepted, but there, there are also provisions that uh, streets should be open at least at one end and beyond 60 feet in length open at both ends and a minimum separation of between buildings, uh, between buildings facing each other, uh, a limit to the height of buildings, um, ventilation and light, um, each room to have at least one window, uh, minimum window area, one tenth of the floor area. And uh, I think, was it last year, we heard about proposals to create uh, flats out of uh, industrial premises in Watford, which weren't to have any windows at all. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> um, in terms of the manual for streets of the time, this is it. You're looking at the Victorian manual for streets. There isn't any, anything more than this. It's all there. And it would lead to uh, streets that look like this. Um, we have a 24 foot wide carriageway, six foot footways, 
curves of three to seven inches and a crossfall of between one in 16 and one in 32 from the, the crown of the carriageway. And different requirements for uh, alleys and back streets. Um, it's all there on uh, archive.org if you ever want to look at these things. Um, or if you ever want to look at them, the chances are um, you, there'll be a street like this in close proximity to your house. Indeed, you may well live on one. Um, I, I think something like a fifth of um, streets in, in Britain uh, com conform to the standards in the, in the bylaws or that Town Police Clauses Act. Um, so here we have an illustration in Country Life of 1901. There was actually a campaign against the model bylaws, which were, they argued, were vexatious. Um, so here's some examples. Um, this is in Oxford, uh, a terraced housing street, uh, 645,000 if you want to buy those. Um, and there's the um, aerial view, uh, a grid forms, the, 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 the junction corner radii are very tight, and it's, it's pretty good for pedestrians, I think, quite easy to get across that. Um, and another another vista. There's no real room for tree planting other than where there is that the buildings are set back, but it's possible to get quite big trees. And I think that's quite an attractive vista there. Um, so 30 foot wide. Um, it, going up to Bolton, where you can buy a, a similar size property for £115,000. Um, 36 foot wide carriageway, back streets of 16 foot um, for the removal of ash, privy waste. Um, and getting to an aerial view here, um, there is no green space in that uh, particular development uh, of housing at all, as far as I can see. Um, stuff on the far right is not of the same period. Um, I think there are examples, aren't there, where people have turned the back streets into, um, you know, covered the back streets in planters and the like and made them really very attractive. Yes, I, I think that's that's the case. And a, a Golden Lane in Norwich, the housing that um, it, it it got a whole series of awards last year. Um, I think it, it uses a similar sort of principle of having a back lane, but as a, a, a shared um, landscaped environment, something that's really attractive, rather than um, in this design just intended for uh, utility purposes. So um, another example of the 40 foot street here, um, new high street in, again, back in Oxford. And there you have the famous Headington shark. Um, you may ask whether the, the shark would have complied with the bylaws. And in fact, yes, it would have done, provided if it were made of non-combustible material. Um, and London Building Act, we've got a 40 foot wide street here, 24 foot wide carriageway. And you can see in uh, 1910, um, quite a few people around, children in the street. A um, hundred years on, no children, no people, uh, a whole load of cars. And <laughs> so you've got low traffic neighbourhoods. Quite so. <laughs> Where we, we experience a 70% reduction in uh, injury accidents and a 15% reduction in crime. So we're led to, uh, led to believe. And it, there's the Elborough Street grid. It's a grid again. Um, so um, that is the, uh, <clears throat> the gist of the, well, I guess the manual for streets of the Victorian period. Um, we just can talk a, bit, a little about uh, sort of social and practical uh, issues. Street names were, were being introduced. Um, and you can link this to the arrival of the penny penny post, the uniform penny post. Um, it helps if there are uh, defined uh, lists of streets and street numbering is introduced. Um, it's also yeah, one of the clues to the age of a street is what their what their their name is. Um, and there has been a was a tradition in the Victorian period to name certain streets after heroes or battles and the Battle of Alma. Um, is a, um, a battle in the Crimean War, I think. Um, and now we come on to traffic, and um, uh, <clears throat> David's going to help me out with this. So um, we have increasing speeds, and 
mechanization of road transport, um, steam carriages, traction engines, and a set of legislation that is intended to limit speeds. And it begins to be rolled back after 1896, uh, when higher speed limits are introduced. I don't think we, we come on to this, Robert, but the 1897 is the um, foundation of the Automobile Association Automobile Club, which becomes a Royal Automobile Wed Club when Edward VII joins, and they are campaigning really from 1897 against the 14 mile an hour speed limit. And on the, maintenance, on the maintenance side, we've got the General Highways Act, 1835. It's, you sometimes have to refer back to the General Highways Act if you can't understand bits in the Highways Act 1980. Um, it, it, for example, tree planting. Um, some people think uh, it, 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 planting trees in the carriageway is not permitted. And they look at um, terms in the Highways Act 1980 that appear to prohibit this. Um, but it, the purpose of the, the powers that were given to highway authorities to control um, street trees and, and hedges, um, they were there to um, just ensure the safety of um, people on horses, um, stop them being knocked off by, um, by low branches. Um, county councils established in 1888 as, as highway authorities. Um, I, I think, a, we, we haven't filled that out in any particular detail, but there was a, a struggle over that entire century uh, over how to fund the maintenance and manage the maintenance of, of highways. And if we're honest, the, the struggle over maintenance goes on to this day. Um, over to you, David. So in terms of um, in commuter transport, I think Shillabier's omnibus came to London in 1829. Um, there may have been something in the mumbles in 1801. Uh, so the omnibus starts off, which in 1829, which is great for the uh, the wealthier suburbanites. So as, as uh, northern parts of Islington, Camden, Hackney develop, those sort of vast range of, of Victorian houses, um, 1829 wouldn't have been Victorian, but subsequently they could take, they could travel by omnibus. Um, it was uncomfortable and it was expensive. So it wasn't travel for working men who continued on the whole to have to walk into, uh, into central London to work. Hence the popularity of, uh, of living in the, sort of on the edge of the, of the city in Southern Islington, for example, et cetera. So expensive and not actually that nice, despite what the picture seemed. Because uh, Chilibia brought the omnibus from Paris, which started up uh, fairly earlier. Carry on, Robert. So to get um, really to make a difference for the working man, um, oh, have we got the tram anywhere? So there's a bus, uh, railways um, are not really uh, are too expensive also for working men until quite late in the, uh, in the century. And that's when uh, it's, it's with those, the cheap working man's railway tickets that, um, Whereas like Walthamstow and that outer ring of, uh, of suburban London uh, villages start to develop on a massive scale and very quickly. Do we, um, do we have the horse tram anywhere? Um, well, it was that mumbles thing. Uh, that was 1801. Yeah. So the, it, sorry, it, the horse tram is, is, is vitally important in the, in the history of, uh, of working men's uh, travel. Um, though this, there is this example from 1801, it only really starts in the 1860s and isn't successful until later in the, uh, until a few decades later. And that is what transforms travel for, uh, for working men who are working women as well, who cease to be uh, traveling to, you know, who, who can now at last stop walking, very bad for their health, and go on a horse tram. It's because the tramways are much more efficient because you've got a much less traction on the real line and tram lines are built um, into, into central London. They're not in very much in the middle of central London. Okay. And so then you have electrification and then um, you start to get uh, 
motor buses um, towards the uh, in the early 20th century, which obviously connected with the internal combustion engine, and uh, and the and there's a splendid picture which Robert will describe there quite what he is doing, lying under uh, a United Electric car on the tram. Well, I, I was rather tired at the time um, going around the uh, the London Transport Museum, but it's a um, the safety device to stop people being um, uh, chopped up into bits by the by the tram wheels. You'll see that there's a wooden barrier um, right at the front of the tram. Uh, if somebody falls in front of the tram, um, they they strike that, um, and what it does is lower a sort of scoop that's right in front of the wheels that I'm actually lying on there. I think I'm, I need to lose a bit of weight, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, on the do we have the do we have the slide of the people walking over London Bridge? Yes, we do. It's next but one. Um, and anyway, here's here's Emma Griffin, um, uh, uh, who's behind the Footways uh, campaign. Um, she's demonstrating the mechanism there, um, and uh, it, she's quite confident that he's going to save her life. Um, it's bizarre that this sort of technology was introduced to stop people being killed. And even in the 21st century, um, the adaptation to vehicles to provide pedestrian safety features is pretty limited. Um, <clears throat> it's so the pedestrian safety directive around 2000 to, uh, to try and design, um, you know, the European directive to try and design cars that were less likely to kill pedestrians which the British government, egged on by its uh, motor industry, uh, lobbied against. Hence the fact we have all those killer SUVs on the road. And bull bars, an absolutely absurd uh, addition to the road environment. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite scandalous, I think. Um, anyway, whoops. <clears throat> So we've done that. Oh, so here we are. So even as late as the 18, in 1850, we don't really know a lot about the history of, uh, of walking and numbers involved, but there was a survey called the Select Committee, Parliamentary Select Committee on Metropolitan Improvements, um, where experts uh, said there were 400,000 people walking into and out of the city of London every day. And of course, the footways project that Emma and I have started aims to return to that and get people out of um, you know, other forms of transport and walking again for their health, sanity and mental well-being. Even in 1890, with the horse tram, you still have very large numbers of people uh, walking in, as, as you can see in this beautiful picture. Robert. Ah, and then we have the, uh, the golden ages of cycling starting with the penny farthing. Um, I, we won't say too much about this because Carlton Reed has written this splendid book, uh, Roads Were Not Built for Cars, which tells you this sort of history in, in, in great detail and is, is well worth the read. It's a magnificent book. Though I don't think he's right about Roman roads, but apart from that, much to be recommended. Anyway, Robert. So the, the safety bicycle really brings in the golden age of cycling um, and is, uh, is at first uh, something for the wealthy classes, sort of leisure pursuit, uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous fun, large numbers of people. Um, and this leads to um, pneumatic tyres, which were developed at the time, and campaign for better road surfaces, and it was also very, uh, really, uh, was it went with the emancipated woman as well. So it's a sort of golden age for cycling. Women can get out on their own. Um, and a, a glorious, the 1890s, what a glorious period it was for those people with their bicycles. Um, and, and the editor, I think one of the leading writers of The Guardian talks about cycling to, to Manchester from London for the day. 19 hours, an extraordinary feat. Um, so there we are. Uh, Robert, anything you want to say about bicycles apart from what a wonderful time it was? No, just more um, more illustrations. I suppose what one question would be, how affordable would bicycles have been at the time? And are, are they the preserve of the rich, the wealthy? They're the preserve of quite well-off people, yeah. Mm. 
at this stage. They look a bit severe. Um, so now, um, infrastructure for increased traffic. So um, in in urban areas, um, you, you start to see in the in the learning society papers this term of improving circulation. Um, uh, you see a smashing through of the urban fabric and the building of new roads, and in some areas, um, wholesale demolition and of slums and and reconfiguring of different. Uh, differently aligned streets with new buildings and everything. And David's going to talk about this bit. Right, so that um, we don't normally hear a great deal about the Metropolitan Board of Works and the, uh, and the extraordinary uh, amount of uh, demolition they did and building of new roads, which, um, which was a bit like how, no, very much the same sort of thing that Houseman did except that uh, the roads weren't quite so wide, probably apart from the embankment. Um, I suppose in a way, we, we're saying here that um, got the, the new road, which isn't, which is put through countryside, now the, the Euston and, and Marylebone roads and, and down to the city, which is used for taking livestock to, uh, to Smithfield. Regent Street is, is completed after the, after 1810, really about the time of when our talk starts in the 1820s. But this is not only a, a new road, but it's also built to demarcate the fashionable areas of Mayfair and Marylebone from the slums to the east. So it's there deliberately to create severance so that you know, it was more difficult to, for, the, uh, for the slum dwellers in St Giles and around Seven, seven Dials to, uh, to get into the, the smarter areas to the west. And then we have this great uh, period of, of road building with new roads uh, smashed through, mostly uh, dealt with, um, with slum, also an attempt at slum clearance. So getting rid of, uh, of, poor, you know, of poor housing, but, uh, but not providing on the whole any housing in, in its place. So it simply led to more overcrowding elsewhere. One exception to this was Northumberland Avenue, where they destroyed the Duke of Northumberland's um, uh, 17th century uh, Jacobean home. And of course, the worst of all was the biggest destruction of all was Kingsway. Do we have a separate slide of that, Robert? And here it is. Um, thousands of, uh, well, 500 homes uh, destroyed um, for this huge uh, project that in some respects was never that successful because it uh, it doesn't continue north so it sort of stops at Southampton Row um, destroyed beautiful uh, obviously then not very well looked after medieval houses and only one of which survives which is the so-called old curiosity shop um, thousands displaced um, desperate to find homes elsewhere, etc. Extraordinary, and and the last sort of great act and and and, and great savagery of uh, of Edwardian England. Okay, Robert. Well, um, 1895, um, Tunbridge Wells, uh, about five miles away from where I am at the moment. I don't live in Tunbridge Wells. I'm in Tunbridge, um, the world's first motor shape possibly the world's first. Um, not very many uh, cars exhibited, but things rapidly changed. Um, so within uh, 10 years, pra practically, uh, at Brooklands um, to the south of London, a massive banked racetrack is created. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, race meetings and <clears throat> this sort of spirit of speed has really taken, taken hold. Um, and, and around about 19, 1905 or so, 1906, um, you're still on the sort of, on the edge, so to speak. So there's great hostility to, uh, to motor cars all over, all over the Western world. Um, articles from aristocrats in the, uh, in the papers attacking the inconsiderate motorists, warning of how dangerous they are. In the Netherlands, uh, motorists are pelted, they're shot at in America. So at first, I suppose a bit like the um, e-bikes, um, e-scooters today, massive resistance. 
And then just round about this period, 1905 to 1910, attitudes completely change. I'm afraid to say. Um, just to, um, as the railway age is coming to a close, um, I, I, there, there's quite a lot of maths involved in railway construction with um, uh, super elevation, transition curves, <clears throat> so, so as to give uh, passengers a smooth ride and not being thrown from one side of the carriage to the other. Um, <clears throat> uh, when I started my career, I, um, I, I spoke to engineers who in county, uh, county councils who talked about there being boxes of railway curves in the, in the department. And there is before you a box of railway curves and <clears throat> some pages from a book published in the 1920s um, that uh, gives you the maths behind uh, working out transition curves. Um, and maybe- we better, we, better, we better hurry up. But, we um, better hurry up. But just to say, um, in the 1890s, in the in 1890, people would have thought the railway age was going to go on forever, and that there was no future in long distance road traffic. Um, as Robert says, by the 1900s, we're not at the end of the railway age, um, but we are um, beginning the period when we start to see a decline in uh, in in rail traffic, which doesn't seriously happen for several decades later. Um, so Edward I joins the RAC club in 1907, making it more fashionable. The RAC club sets up this. It's, it's RAC club is the uh, is for the sort of the rich, the aristocrats, and the uh, and the nouveau riche. It builds this extraordinary, huge, largest of gentlemen's clubs in uh, in 1911. Um, it is more the, uh, the, in a way, almost the more acceptable face of, of, of motoring in that uh, it's really for recreational purposes. Um, it campaigns, but not as aggressively as the AA, which is, uh, which is set up to, uh, to really, you know, really as, a, as the Daily Mail to the, uh, to the Times, which might be the RAC club, to aggressively campaign for the working men, uh, for, uh, for drivers. Um, and by now, you really are getting more traffic on the roads. You're getting the road fund, and you're getting campaigns which are started by the uh, by the cyclists for the tarmacadding, the the road network. And I suppose the last thing to be said is that interestingly, many of the people who cite Mr. Rolls, who were enthusiastic motorists, had started life as cyclists. There's this love of of speed and getting about. When the 1890s they'd have been cyclists, by the 1900s they'd have become motorists. So that is the last slide. And uh, we have <clears throat> the First World War before us, um, a political situation that is now very much pro uh, car use. It's driven by the, the wealthiest and the most powerful in society. And um, that, uh, if you'll suffer it, will be um, for a future occasion. And it's where things start to get transformed and not necessarily for the better. And casualties start to mount very significantly. So thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, I mean, I'm gonna give you a round of applause. It's, uh, it's brilliant to hear all that and go through. Um, has anybody got any um, quick questions before we roll on with the rest of it? I can see Dave Halliday uh, with a uh, waving his hands. Go on, Dave. We'll have to unmute yourself first, mate. Then, then I'll go to Graham. The hands I can exactly. see. My, my favourite you touched on, Town Police Clauses Act. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Section 28 uh, from 1847 is very much going to be useful for getting all these scooters and things off uh, footways. Uh, and it also uh, goes to the eight foot clearance. Um, I bang my head on a bus stop and I invoke the police, the Town Police Clauses Act 1847 uh, because everything's got to clear eight feet over a, a footway, uh, which is quite handy when you're, when you're six foot or tall and bang yourself on all sorts of things. Uh, the sets, we have a street built in 1840, which is still as good as new where it hasn't been hit by utilities. But the ones you illustrated were loose bonded, 
where there's a big gap and it, it's how it's laid modern times where you brush in dry mix to the gaps. Now that works out over time and all the sets work loose. If you get a really good quality street, um, it's built with a tight bond. They don't move. It's wonderfully smooth to ride on on a bike um, and um, hardly needs maintenance in 160 years if it's not touched. Um, and then the fifth thing that follows through from that is I mentioned cast iron curbs and plates and stones. In a cobbled street, you often found those laid in the street for um, vehicles to roll on. And I've made a comment in the, the comments about uh, getting the pond laid right. It must lay across. And in Sheffield, you've got some uh, sets just outside the station on the busway. And they're all coming out because the, the bond or the coursing of the, the sets is along the direction of travel. So all the buses accelerating across it rip the, rip the thing apart. I think that's probably covered most of the bits and pieces, but, um, you know, fantastic and, and interesting. But I think we, we can actually go back to some very good quality streets if we go back to the way they were built properly with stone. That's absolutely fascinating, Dave. And you do notice in, uh, for example, in, uh, in Cowcross Street, where sets were laid, how, how badly they must have been laid. And they obviously didn't listen to you. And they've, <laughs> they've come up rapidly. They obviously haven't consulted the right engineers. Well, you've got to build a good roadbed. Um, a lot of the best streets were laid on puddled clay or coal tar. Um, and I think they've all, the ones I'm looking at uh, locally, I think they also ran uh, loose tar. You know, the way we've got this sort of um, tar tarry liquid so that the two faces of the set sit together. If they sit together very close, they can move a little bit to allow for movement in the sub subgrade in the road, in the base, but they'll only move about a millimeter and they won't rock. So you have a flexible road surface, which, um, you know, lasts for years and it won't pothole because it doesn't form big dips. Amazing. Nice. Uh, Thank I'll you. bring Graham in now. Graham, did you have a question? Sorry. We'll have to... Wait a bit. The, yeah, the, the reason for street geometry, um, it, it occurred to me, uh, I'm seeing a Model T on the side of the street some years ago, that it has no front brakes. So the Model T, which was enormously influential, obviously, in changing the nature of things, presumably couldn't go around corners very quickly because stopping was difficult. It could go adequately fast. And it was, it was in production for a huge number of uh, decades. And, and I was reading a little while ago that Henry Ford objected to um, engineers trying to put front brakes on the Model T. And he actually argued against it. And, and so there were secondary market front brake kits that you could buy to fit on your Model T. But if the early cars, if the earliest car sold, selling in huge numbers couldn't couldn't break very quickly. That would be one of the obvious reasons for uh, for very generous curves on corners. Question. Well, surely, uh, if you've got rear brakes, you can do a handbrake turn in a Model T Ford. Would somebody like to try this out and report back at a future meeting? I don't think. I don't think the rear brake was that good either. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, right. On lifeguards. Oh, mate. Uh, well, we might, um, we've got, still got quite a bit to do, so I'm just going to thank uh, Robert and David again for, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely want you back for the war years. <laughs> right, I thank you so much every... for indulging us. Thank you. Thank no, you very much. Thank you. Absolutely love it. Um, all right, I'm just going to get uh, Claire to do a quick talk about something we're doing because we've got our anniversary event coming up and, uh, and Claire's going to ask for something. So, Claire, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um... Yeah, a couple of things to uh, share with people. Um, although, yeah, I think we should take bets on when when the guys will get to the present day, what point of the year will be. Uh, that would be quite fun. Um, so, yeah, two things. One is uh, we've got the um, anniversary special coming up. Brian has designated Tuesday the 20th of April as the anniversary special. And um, Bob's going to do a special lessons from last year and Brian's lining up some special guests, which um, he's keeping under wraps. But the thing that I was gonna say is that um, 
we thought it'd be great if we did a kind of like open mic section in that Ideas with Beers anniversary special. And we'd love it if like people volunteered to do like just a couple of minutes, any form you like from your locality, kind of your perspective, um, try and get as many voices, as many perspectives from around the UK, uh, you know, good, bad, ugly, um, that's not you, that's the subject, you know, what's your perspective of what's been going on? And what would be great is if you kind of posted in the chat, if you'd be up for that, and I'll try and, um, you know, just, just sort of facilitate that section. Uh, my job would be, I might give a little not Greater Manchester perspective, but also I'll be on the timer, <laughs> which is this, which maybe we should have every week as a, a way of keeping, um, keeping people on time. So that, um, that's the anniversary, yeah. It'd be great to just hear from as many voices as possible and try and make it um, uh, like this sort of, I don't know if any of you watch uh, like Final Score on TV where they do around the grounds, the football grounds, all the scores coming in. So yeah, something like that maybe. Um, so that's it on the anniversary. The other thing to say is that there's not gonna, Brian, um, asked me to say that we're not going to have a meeting next week because it's kind of Easter Tuesday. So I think that was what we agreed. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I missed a meeting where we agreed it, but we agreed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you can have one if you want next week. Um, but yeah, I'm just sharing. A week off is probably good for us all, getting us ready for, the, for episode 50. Yeah, yeah. the anniversary. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing was a bit of Ideas with Beers communications news. So um, be behind the scenes, a few of us got together just to have a little chat about sort of housekeeping and how we help keep things running as smoothly as possible for everyone. And one thing we've done, which I'm about to post in the chat now, is we've created a really, really basic, I'm loathe to even call it a website because it's, it's a work in progress, um, which is here. Uh, there you go. So that is a, um, as I said, website, which is gonna be a place where we'll archive the video recordings of the session and the slides. So um, you'll notice there's a few gaps for the slides. So we are trying to hoover up past slides, but what would make it really easy is if, you, if you've spoken at an ideas with biz if you email the slides to that email they will get uploaded from there so that's the first bit of communications news the second bit of communications news which is on that top of that website is that we've created a form for people to sign up to a mailing list now if brian's already got your email you you're already on that list um but in terms of new people signing up for ideas with biz we wanted to kind of make it a bit easier for Brian so he wasn't having to like cut and paste people's emails out of his inbox and comply with GDPR. So we've created a little form um, for people to, so if you know people, I know having seen the emails in the inbox, people often say, oh, here's so-and-so Joe Blogs, could you add him to the list? Well, now all you need to do is send them, actually just send them the website link because the form's linked at the top of that, but that's the form directly. So that's the second bit of communications news. And then the third bit of communications news is that um, in keeping with the anniversary and, you know, this has been this space that Brian kicked off um, and it's kind of grown and evolved. We thought that we'd do a little survey to get people's feedback on, on ideas for beers. And um, I'm just going to post that now. So that's, uh, we're doing that survey to yeah, just give people a chance to say what they think about the format. If you know people who, you know, you want to share that with, feel free. And the, um, all we will commit to is the, you know, behind the scenes kind of people trying to help make the session run smoothly is that we will review that feedback and bring it back to a future session to kind of share with the group. Obviously, if people come up with a trillion ideas, when you know, we're not necessarily here to make everything happen, but it'd be good to just give people a chance to feedback on what they think of the format, what they like, what they might tweak and, um, and anything else you want to say. So that's 
uh, that's it really. I've quite a few things to take in there, but hopefully um, the chat means it's kind of set out quite clearly. Is there anything anyone, Brian or um, Ruth, who I can see, or Steve want to add that I've forgotten to say? Um, no, I think that's all good from, from my perspective. See Steve yeah, brilliant work, Claire. Yeah, no, it's Thank great you, to have a bit of organisation. We've been <laughs> just winging it for so long. But yeah, it's, uh, it's all good. But just, oh, Brian, to remind you, the sixth is probably still school holes. So that was another good reason. So we can get people with children to come along. Yep. Yeah, no, my children have already been in. <laughs> no, but anyway, yeah, all good. All right, then, should we move on? Bob, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay, go. so it's slightly different time. Uh, here we go. Um, is it still sunny, Bob? It is still so. Can you see that, everybody? Yeah, you're you're all good, Bob. Okay, and thanks again to Claire and also Steve for doing all the uh, techie stuff. A lot of work went into that. Okay, so here's our update 30th of March. Uh, do send me links and slides to give information. Um, right, today the theme will be the Wokingham factor, but uh, we'll come on to that towards the end. Right, so first thing, who said this? Bit of a question to you. We reject false choices between fixing the roads we have and making space for alternative modes of transportation. Americans deserve world-class quality and a full range of good options to get where they need to be. Uh, it's Pete Buttergig. And he also said, you should not have to own a car to prosper in this country, no matter what kind of community you're living in. Pretty radical for America. Okay, that's broken the UK only rule. So, uh, news is that CWIS 2 uh, from the uh, Minister, Mr. Heaton Harris, is to be published as soon as possible. Uh, it was supposed to be reviewed or coming up again last year. So, it's one of these things which will be as soon as possible now. Uh, here's a nice little graphic I picked up. Uh, is it really cheaper to cycle to work? Uh, how many months would you have to ride a bike for it to be cheaper than taking public transport? Uh, London comes down to two months only. I'm not sure how they calculate that, but it's uh, interesting compared to other places with better public transport. Right. Now, this is a cracker of a report which you uh, need to read from the creds people, uh, Dr. Marsden, Professor. Gillian Annabel. Uh, uh, you can get a very, very short few, couple of tweets from Greg Marsden. Otherwise, go to the uh, short report and it finds out things like, uh, as a consequence of COVID-19 and restrictions, 20% um, more people are walking regularly, 60% uh, are reliant on the bus for some journeys, and they don't panic too much about there being too many cars. As many people gave up cars as bought new cars. So that's, so that's one of our worries addressed. Uh, and they would, they're big on pushing walk, working from home. Uh, if people work at home two days a week, this will cut trips by 14%. Um, I think it's a bit more complicated than that because you need to look at trips that people make from home when they work from home. Working from home's a big issue, something we need to keep an eye out on. Anyway, so that's a must read for, for all of you. And they say building back better needs to be building back differently. Here, here. We all agree with that. And also announced today another voucher scheme because the last one went was emptied in two days. Okay, back on the uh, male violence, personal security, the disgraceful stirring up by Justin Rowlatt. Um, uh, that's again a must read. I repeat that from last week because it really was uh, dreadful reporting. Um, 
there's something from Sarah Green about how uh, women's safety being abused by the anti-LTN people. Uh, what's That's been updated by Carlton. Uh, very inadequate reply from Sarah Nelson of BBC News to Tony Barkley. And what's new this week is a lovely thing from Peter Worker. He says, the curse of modern news, report on controversy and strong feelings. Make sure you hear from the sides. Is there a factual basis to the report? Well, that seems a secondary consideration. Depressing. Uh, Peter Walker's good. Great bloke. Um, Oh, yeah, and some pretty hopeless reporting of school streets uh, up in the northeast. Um, uh, local BBC getting it wrong there. So that's a, a Twitter thread you can have a look at. Now, Ed Miliband spent some time saying, oh, we need to push on climate action, but it's just about subsidising EVs, uh, electric vehicles, as you know. On the issue of fairness, low-income families are all too often priced out of electric vehicle ownership. So the excellent Leo Murray says, my dude, three quarters of the poorest households cannot afford a car of any kind, and your speech had absolutely nothing in it for them. So, it, and he's got some nice figures on the people who've got no cars, uh, or people who've only got one car. Um, so, uh, look at that chart and um uh julio of london strustrand's got in there and put up some graphics of his own julia farini uh, this is london figures uh relating incomes to uh whether you're using a car or a van so uh you know people in the lower uh sections have a lot less car uh, ownership and use um Take a look at those at your leisure. Uh, here's the must read page and general stuff. Uh, uh, here's something new, a guy called Freewheeling on the Future of Cars Summit, worth a look at that. Um, something from a new website for Transport for Greater Manchester, a survey saying almost half of people responsible keep cycling and walking more often after lockdown. That's new. Um, I've mentioned the 20 minute neighborhood before, so not new, but do take a look at that. Uh, lovely report on uh, the Silvertown Tunnel. Uh, it's, yeah, okay, it's London, but um, it's important nationally. Um, and stuff I've done before. Uh, right, this is the latest things on low traffic neighborhoods. Um, incident response times for the fire brigades in London. Uh, that's another piece of evidence for us. Don't forget the Lambeth Council monitoring report, exemplary uh, report on monitoring, and all the other stuff which you need to use for anybody who is actually interested in the evidence. But don't forget, people often aren't. So uh, there's a thing there, a oh, lovely thread from Jeremy Vine. I know a lot of people think that he, he does get anti-cyclists on his show, but he did a lovely thread on Twitter. Do take a look at, at what he says. Um, uh, now, this is an absolutely must read new. Cycling is 10 times more important than electric cars for reaching net zero cities by a guy called Christian Brown. And that's proper research. Do get uh, to read it. Absolutely must read. I'm not going to say more, but it's vital evidence. Um, all these you've seen before. Not this one. This is from Professor Julia Steinberger. Uh, I wish you personally understood that we're on the brink of civilizational destruction and that you have to choose a side, collapse or transformation. There are no more bystanders, just those trying to save lives. So that's important. Uh, take a look at, uh, follow her, it's all worth talking about. Um, and uh, other stuff, oh yeah, um, this is from, uh, uh, 
John, uh, Joe Burke on shared use and covert cyberways from at war with a motorist worth a quick read. Um, and uh, a nice thing on the hypocrisy of consultation requirements here. Very short read, very good. Uh, oh yeah, and I just thought you'd like to see Peter Hitchens on e-scooters. I don't normally uh, give a link to the Daily Mail because I don't want to encourage hits on it, but um, although he goes completely over the top, he does have some things to be said uh, in, on, in, in his case. I think I tweeted about it, not going to say, say any more and duck for cover. Okay, diversity page. Uh, the newest thing is something from the Ride Shimano tweet uh, here. It's about uh, women with bigger bodies um, and ha all bodies on bikes. It's American discusses society's obsession with weight and how bicycling can bring people together. So that's a nice little video there. Uh, delay slide is now the what's happening slide. There is a little bit more news on active travel in England, not on part six road traffic act. And the news on active travel England is they've advertised cheap operating officer. Um, and I think uh, she or he will be the head honcho. And that's good. It's the second ad advert we've seen. But what is troubling is look at that salary, sixty thousand pounds. You know, it it if active travel England is going to be taken seriously, they need to have people in who in the, the head of it should be on a six figure salary as far as I'm concerned. Otherwise, it's you know just not going to be taken that seriously. And they do have the money. I mean, it might cost them an extra million quid or so to have all the right um, uh, people in post. But then they've supposedly got uh, the rest of the two billion pounds to be spent, so they should have money available, and we want them to have more money available beyond that two billion anyway. Okay, in the UK, uh, East Surrey, uh, look at that thread. Uh, latest cabinet papers confirm for East Surrey the council proposed to use tranche two active travel funding. Uh, for two shared use fo footways. Well, you know, we need Ankle Travel England to just stamp on that ASAP. Uh, Suffolk, uh, Ipswich, I mentioned UK's first 15 minute town says, but Lou, Leo Borwick, our man on the ground there says, unfortunately the 15 minute town thing is mostly just a headline. Uh, they talk about 15 minutes being the drive time for visitors and walking time between three key points surrounding the town centre. Passing mention of cycling and walking, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. Uh, so that wasn't as good as I'd hoped. Um, don't forget Cyclist Defence Fund to give for cases like Upper Shoreham Road action, where uh, Cycling UK is fighting that, trying to get uh, uh, a judicial review. Okay, now here's the Wokingham factor. This is uh, from Local Transport Today, and I'm just going to read through it because I think it's really what we have to worry about. So the report says DFT's new cycle infrastructure design standards cannot be reflected in all the new schemes because many have been designed before the guidance was published last summer. And it's about LTN 120. And DFT said it will be a condition of any future government funding uh, that is designed to be consistent with LTN 120. But Wokingham Borough Council say it is impractical for all proposed schemes to be consistent with the new gui guidance. Uh, their guy says uh, these schemes that are currently in development will be viewed on a case by case basis. For those that are developer funded or involve housing, negotiations may have already taken place and it may not be possible to gain the required land or make suitable design amendments to meet our placement making policies. The council should aim, aim to meet LTN 120, but it is recognised there will be constraints on many existing or emerging schemes. Similarly, for those schemes that are yet to commence, 
although the majority of schemes will be designed in LTN 120, and here's the killer, there will be a need to be a balance between this and other policies. Well, that's the crawling out of it excuses, and we really have to jump on that. Note the word of the balance, balance the needs of all road users, meaning we're gonna crack on with the status quo. So, naughty Wokingham, BC. Uh, this is London here in city of Westminster. They've got this, this is a graphic to put a mountain so-called at the end of Oxford Street. And that plan goes to committee today. Uh, they're not actually doing the changes in, well, in Oxford Street, which uh, the current mayor Sadiq Khan came to power promising to pedestrianize Oxford Street. That's not on the cards, but this plan has gone to committee today. Tamlets consultants suggest new pedestrian bridge should exclude cyclists. Well, that is uh, wrong. Kenzie and Chelsea, I've put these slides up before and no change there that I've heard of, but you know, obviously it's a key issue. Uh, here's some slides, some photos from Lucy Master and uh, this is the Hollymount Primary School Street enforced by PCSOs. And when they're not there, uh, it's just like business as usual as it was. Uh, thanks, Lucy. Um, Brent, I mentioned this stuff about how the council is failing in three areas, still keeping that up. Uh, Royal Parks, there's been uh, proposals to charge parking, uh, but it has to go, I think it has to go to Parliament or somewhere to, to get final validation. Um, my view is that it's a bit of a waste of time anyway, because the issue is not people driving to the park to go there and walk around. The issue is people driving through and charging them, and that hasn't actually been addressed at all by these parking charges. So a bit hopeless there. Uh, city, uh, yeah, we like the city. City of London Corporation unveils plans to pedestrianise areas around bank. Uh, so that looks nice. They're cracking on with that, hopefully. Um, Waltham Forest, now this is a tremendously important graphic. I've shown you this before. It shows that at specific areas which are being beneficially affected by their uh, Mini Holland, etc., that uh, in black last year, increasing amounts of cycling right through to the winter months and through the semi-relaxations of lockdowns. And this year in green, uh, that continues that upward trend. So that's good graphic from Waltham Forest, bit of good news there. Uh, and this is nice from uh, Cycle Islington, they call this Shades. This is people cycling in the separated uh, cycle lanes and I think soon to be separated cycle lanes with sunglasses on. Isn't that nice? Uh, nice bit of cheery graphic. And finally, um, I know you like the old advert advertisements. So here is one from British Rail 1979 saying there is an alternative to commuting by rail, but could we live with it? Uh, what you would have to do if everybody went by car. Um, need 120 additional lanes of highway. Uh, so there you go. David Harrison and Robert still here. Do we know? I'm still here. Okay, so um, Chester, Grosvenor Bridge is where I'm from and um, it's an absolute classic example. It's the most beautiful bridge. Uh, it's a, a nightmare to walk across, uh, even worse to cycle across because all the traffic from North Wales comes into Chester down that way. Chester was one of the first cities to go pedestrianised sometime in the 70s, which was a brilliant idea because it's, as you know, a very ancient town, fantastic shops, uh, everything. But it kind of failed dismally because nobody was going to risk cycling or walking over that bridge. And repeatedly people have suggested putting cantilevered, stylish, modern things like they had at um, Hungerford, but it has failed. And so it's kind of an example of where we you know, style over substance. So we retain something because of its historical value. And it is incredible um, if none of you've been there. In fact, Hambridge Bridge is also beautiful, which I think is 11th century, possibly. Would you know, David, Robert? 
No. Sorry, I'm not a bridge person. Uh, oh, okay. Dr. Sorry. Harrison, <laughs> very to disappoint. Oh, okay. But anyway, so we did cycle to school and we risked our lives. And then when my parents were kind of dying and I was going up there to see them, I used to cycle across the bridge and it was awful. So sometimes we have to let a bit of history, Hammersmith Bridge potentially, go for making something that would be safe for people to walk and cycle because it is fantastic. So if any of you ever go to Chester, do take a look at the bridge. And underneath the bridge is a model of the bridge. And that uh, a scale model, it's stunning. So that's all I'm going to tell you today.